Coming up in the morning edition, the Prime Minister will present a communication in Parliament today. Also, in order to prepare our, our students, we have to prepare our teachers. Schools implementing virtual training exercises to ensure a smooth process this new academic year. And I just wanted to help my Bahamian people. A sixth grader attempting to help families suffering from the COVID-19 pandemic. Those stories and more when the morning edition comes right back. body of the Bahamas Association of Medical Technologists, or BAMAT, offer this pronouncement because our celebratory activities were suspended. We wish to say thank you to all essential healthcare workers, police and defense force officers, and to encourage the youth of this nation to seek out fields in the medical laboratory profession. And to let you know that this is a viable option for a successful and rewarding career. Scholarships are available through the Ministries of Health and Education to help you reach your goals. This announcement is brought to you by the Bahamas Association of Medical Technologists in conjunction with the Broadcasting Corporation of the Bahamas. I'm LaDawn Davis. Thank you so much for tuning in. The Ministry of Health confirming in its latest dashboard that there are 73 additional confirmed cases of COVID-19 in this country, 72 here in New Providence, and one over in Grand Bahama. This brings the total number of confirmed cases to 4,632. 62 additional persons have recovered, bringing that number to 2,537. The Ministry of Health also confirms the death of a 76-year-old female of New Providence who passed away on October 1st, and the death of a 46-year-old male of Abaco who passed away on September 17th. The COVID-19 death toll is now up to 102. Should all go as planned, Prime Minister, the Most Honorable Dr. Hubert Minnis will this morning present a communication in the House of Assembly on the recommendations of health experts on the way forward, particularly as it relates to New Providence and Abaco. The former, the former contributing to the vast majority of confirmed COVID-19 cases on a daily basis and increasing deaths. When last checks, the country's overall mortality rate was at 2.2%. That puts the Bahamas at an average of one death per day. As said repeatedly by health experts, success in addressing community spread depends on the public's behavior and adherence to COVID-19 preventative measures. Now, according to House Speaker Holson Moultrie, today's House meeting may be a brief one considering Marathon MP Ramal Ferreira testing positive for COVID-19. We'll see how it, it turns out. Um, if we are unable to have a quorum tomorrow, then the proceedings will be adjourned to a later date. Mm -hmm. There is a quorum, but um, the, there's no ready business to conduct. We will go, go through the, the um, order of the day, order, order of business, and adjourn to a later date. That is where we are now. Just recently, a staffer at the House of Assembly tested positive for the virus. Moultrie says they're working with less. What we're doing right now is we are on a rotation. We have a certain number of staff members that will work on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. And then a, uh, uh, the other complement of staff will work on Tuesdays and Thursdays. The following week, those who work on Tuesdays and Thursdays will work on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. And so we have that rotation in. So we will have a skeleton staff that's sufficient to conduct the affairs uh, of Parliament. 
Opposition Progressive Liberal Party leader Philip Brave Davis told the media at his monthly press conference on Tuesday that he did not attend the special cabinet meeting featuring the country representative of the Pan American and World Health Organization. The Prime Minister extended the invitation to the opposition during his national address on Sunday. The PLP leader said a separate briefing with PAHO and the WHO has been arranged for members of his party early next week. He also noted that he does not support the continuation of lockdowns. Previous lockdowns have proved useless. After every lockdown, we've had spikes, not a containment or flattening of, of, the, of the effect of COVID-19. And so the question is, is that an effective measure being employed by this government? Or is it that putting this tool in their hands um, just demonstrate or it reveals how incumbent they are to deal with the pandemic. The issue of gun control has resurfaced following a spate of homicides across this country. Now on the heels of the double homicide in Eleuthera this past weekend and the shooting of a young girl on that same island three months ago, Police Commissioner Paul Rose spoke about whether or not he was concerned about a possible spike in violent crimes over on the family islands. Incidents in these family islands, we have prepared and, our, and adjusted much of our strategies after and as the country opens up, we expected and anticipate that there would have been an increase. And unfortunately, at this level, we, nobody could have anticipated the level of gun violence, but we heard a minute ago the, the insatiable desire for firearms. But yes, we will continue to pursue as we see these um, trends, we respond to crime trends and anticipation. The islands themselves are continuing to develop, and with development, there usually is that uh, unfortunate uh, increase in crime. The capital punishment conversation also being brought back to the forefront amid the outrage over those recent spate of murders. National Security Minister the Honorable Marvin Dames reaffirming his position on the matter, pointing out that the country's current situation with violence is more a social issue than a legislative one. I, I firmly believe that, you know, we cannot continue to legislate our way out of the problems we find ourselves in. And that is, that is part of the problem. What we see occurring in this country is, is decades of neglect, a manifestation of neglect by many of us as adults. The violators of crime throughout this country are our kids. And so what does that mean? We all have a vested responsibility to play our respective roles. Regardless of my views about capital punishment, you know, I think it's, it's, it's certainly going to take more than capital punishment to get us to where we need to be. Of the $1.9 million, the Bahamas Department of Correctional Services spends annually feeding nearly 1,500 inmates. $400,000 or 20% is spent on bread alone. Reducing this cost means doing things differently. And according to a report compiled by BDOC's Commissioner Charles Murphy, this includes a partnership with the University of the Bahamas to train officers and inmates in culinary arts. UB has agreed to supply bread at a reduced cost for one year to complement the food sufficiency and meals preparations. The department has remodeled the inmates' kitchen and UB is assisting with operational practices for efficiency. The department is also in discussions with the Department of Agriculture to expand, expand the farming and livestock programs. The goal is to reduce the food budget, promote food security and independence, and teach the inmates agricultural science. Now, as the country lifts restrictions, the department is using a six-pronged reopening phase. And phase one would be the reestablishment of the commissary. Phase two, will be the resumption of inmates' independent visits. Phase three will be to resume the intake of property. Phase four 
will be to resume regular visitations. Phase five will resume worship services. Phase six will resume all other services and programs. The Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Finance giving an update on rebuilding efforts post-Hurricane Dorian. Portions of Abaco and Grand Bahama were decimated by the storm, and one year later, rebuilding continues. Here's Jamila Mizik. Deputy Prime Minister and Member of Parliament for East Grand Bahama, the Honorable K. Peter Turnquest says, one year later, a major concern that residents still have is the pace of recovery and rebuilding efforts post-Hurricane Dorian. He says the government knows that there is tremendous need and persons are still dislocated from their communities. However, unfortunately, the resources to assist is limited, but he says the government has been trying to meet the need as best as they can within those limited resources. We certainly want to encourage our residents to take advantage of the tax concessions uh, that have been uh, put in place and extended uh, through uh, the end of June uh, 2021. Um, the extension for uh, importation of vehicles duty-free and, and VAT-free will expire in December uh, of this year. Um, but the building materials and, and, and the like will extend through uh, 2021. And we want to encourage people not to wait till the last minute, uh, but to try as best they can uh, to acquire the materials they need in order to, uh, to rebuild. The DPM says it has been a tremendous experience for residents given all that has happened and that has been further impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic. Even the resources that would have been normally allocated to uh, reconstruction has, to, has had to be re-diverted now to COVID response, uh, to assist with uh, health infrastructure, to assist with the operating cost of uh, uh, running a 24-hour um, um, emergency, in effect, response to COVID-19, um, the, the, the uh, cost of materials um, uh, to, to, again, provide the services, um, the cost of social assistance at the persons who have been dislocated as a result of uh, loss of jobs or, or, or closures has just been staggering. Um, and so all of this has uh, come uh, as a, almost a perfect storm uh, for us. And it's uh, we, we are seeing the, the uh, challenges uh, as a result of it. But he's encouraging residents to continue to plug along and notes that the government will continue to provide as much assistance as they can, recognizing the limitations and recognizing the needs of residents. Jamila Mizik, ZNS Network News. Staff at the Atlantis Paradise Island Resort staging a march and protest this morning. Lloyd Allen is live with the details. Good morning, Lloyd. Well, good morning, Ladon. Good morning, Bahamas. This morning, we're here at the intersection of Church and East Bay Street, where a protest is set to get started at about 8.30 by Operation Sovereign Bahamas. That uh, group is led by its uh, managing director, Adrian Gibson, who's here with us this morning, Francis, I'm sorry, who's talking to us this morning about uh, why this protest was planned in the first place. Good morning, Mr. Francis. Hey, good morning. Good morning, uh, I'm Lloyd Allen. Uh, first of all, we, uh, we've decided, man, that based on the law that was changed uh, by the competent authority, uh, after 12 weeks, these persons in Atlantis, uh, they are supposed to be made redundant. Uh, nevertheless, the company authority would have, would have decided to um, hold to the investor rather than the people. They seem to acquiesce to the wishes of the, of the investors in this country, whether it's Bahama, whether it's Atlantis, and whether it's all the people in Ocean Club and all the other places. These persons have the right to decide what their future is. Atlantis can make one or two decisions. They can either open the hotel or they can pay the people their redundancies. But the government of the Bahamas made the decision to change uh, the change in the Employment Act to cause where these persons are supposed to be um, 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 made redundant. We're not mad with, with Brookfield. We're not mad with Bahama. We're not mad with anybody. These persons just want the government of the Bahamas to follow the law. You can't change the law at your whim and destroy the Bahamian people. There are people who've come through Operation Southern Bahamas who've lost their, their homes. Um, they, 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 they're being evicted. Um, um, persons to come, ooh, landlords are taken off the doors. They have no food. And now the government has decided to drop the 150 to $100. Um, there is no survival in this. We know and understand to be very critical times. That's not the issue. It's whether or not the competent authority can change the law on his whim, at his whim. It's whether or not the government of Bahamas can do as they please at the behest of the Bahamian people. There are all kinds of mockery going on. 
there's no way on earth any company could decide to hold the people hostage for a year without giving them some kind of understanding of what's going to happen. I know the government is um, 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 negotiating with, with Atlantis and with Bahama and with everybody else. The bottom line is the Bahamian people deserve better, and that's why we're here today. Now, Mr. Francis, of course, uh, today uh, your protest is going to be uh, traversing uh, throughout this area. Where do you plan to take this protest? The, the interesting thing is, of course, the police is here. They blocked the bridge, and they're telling me that um, we, could, we, could, we cannot get any permission to go over the bridge. And so they've decided to block the bridge. And uh, what they've done is, um, you can see it, 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 um, behind us, um, there's scores of police officers, the police cars, and we do this often. And when we believe that there's injustice in the country, we do this. Uh, we don't do this um, because we know and understand the police have, a job, have their job to do. But the bottom line is the Bahamian people also have a right to speak out against the ills that are happening in our country. Um, we, we're going to re-strategize. And uh, in, in the strategy that we are that we're preparing for now, we're going to ensure that the message is actually sent, that what is happening to the Bahamian people is not right. Now, speaking about those many uh, hotel workers who have been affected, uh, also with us this morning is Joy Thompson. She's a 13-year veteran from Atlanta. Uh, she formerly worked in the housekeeping department, but has been furloughed since March. And uh, she says uh, she's experienced a number of challenges since then. Hi, good evening, every morning, everybody. Yes, um, like you said, I've been with the company for 13 years, faithful, you know, and I've been sent home since March, thir March 23rd with nothing. I'm a single mom. I have kids to feed. I have bills to pay. And I have rent that is due. And I think it is very, very, very sad for a company and a government to come together and make a decision on my behalf without even consulting me. You know, you know what it is to be home, you know, without an income, putting in all those years with a company that, 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 that signs off on me, that treats me like, hey, I'm going to get back to you when I get back to you. No, it's time for Atlantis and the government to hear me. My landlord got to hear me. BPL got to hear me. I need Wi-Fi now because we're doing online schooling. All of those institutions has to hear me. So the government and Atlantis needs to hear me. I have no plans of going back to Atlantis. You know, my face is shown. I, I, it doesn't matter. I have no plans to go back. But I am not going to just give it back. I'm not giving back my time. You know, make me redundant. Thank you. And so, of course, like Ms. Thompson, many workers are out here uh, today uh, saying that uh, they're uncomfortable being placed in that furlough seat and uh, need some clarity as they feel as if they've been placed in limbo for several months. Of course, uh, uh, ZNS News will continue to follow this story as it develops throughout the day and in the weeks to come. Reporting this morning from the area of East Bay Street and Church Street for the morning edition, Lloyd Allen, ZNS Network News. Thanks a lot, Lloyd. And still to come, we take a closer look at Back to School. You're watching the Morning Edition. During this pandemic, it is our duty to ensure that all citizens, residents, and visitors are adhering to the COVID-19 safety protocol. Restaurants may operate utilizing curbside pickup, drive through takeaway, or delivery. Any establishment who allows the entry of any person not wearing a mask is liable upon a summary conviction to a fine of $500. I am Ambassador Ashanti Rooker of the COVID-19 Enforcement Unit. Save a life that may be your own. This message brought to you by the Ministry of National Security in conjunction with the Broadcasting Corporation of the Bahamas. We play just like your kids. We text just like your kids. We learn. We even cook. We take selfies. We have hobbies, and we love sports. In every way, we are just like everyone else and enjoy the same things and live our lives every day, just like you do. So if you happen to meet us, treat us just like everyone else. Because at the end of the day, we're just like you. Living life with Down syndrome is simply living. 
To learn more about Down syndrome, call 727-2105. This message is brought to you by the Grand Bahama Down Syndrome Society. You got to make the best of what you have in front of you. And that's some of our problems. We don't know how to make the best of what we've got. You keep on looking out the window and seeing something better. And you think if you get that, that's what's going to make your, oh Lord, this is what's going to make your life better. But I need to tell you, you need to make the best of who you are. Join us this and every Sunday at 8.30 a.m. for Fake Touch on ZNS TV 13. School students of the Nassau Christian Schools on Soldier Road getting the best of both worlds as they receive lessons face-to-face -face and virtually since September 14th. Administrative Assistant Renee Mills says although they have seen an uptick in the number of new students enrolled this year, the virtual and face-to-face -face process has been without hiccups. However, she says there are a number of parents still expressing mixed emotions. The initial uh, start of the school was a bit bumpy at times, um, basically because of the bandwidth, um, you know, just making sure everyone was online constantly, that was a, a, a little bit of a hassle, but we sorted that all out and face-to-face -face from K2 to K4 with a few students um, in the K3 and K4 levels uh, that are virtual, but for the most part, they're all face-to-face. -face. Our K-5 level, strict, strictly virtual. Sustained internet connectivity with local service providers is extremely essential and critical to the education process this new academic school year, primarily as educators are utilizing the virtual learning platform as its key teaching method. Carla Palmer reports this morning that educators are expressing a level of concern and optimism about the virtual learning process. Education officials acknowledge that twice as many students will be engaged in virtual learning this new school term since the COVID-19 pandemic began in March of this year. Before the pandemic, Education Minister the Honorable Jeffrey Lloyd says 1,800 students were engaged in virtual schooling. Now, he says, it's more than doubled to 48,000 in the public school system. It is not just the uh, public schools. The private schools are also virtual. Almost all of them are virtual because we want to reduce the transmission of this disease. Interruption in internet service, brought on by whatever factors, including power outage, is, however, a major concern for this educator, vice principal at Palmdale Primary, Mrs. Antoinette Forbes. The most pressing concern at this point is to ensure that all of our teachers and all of our students have access to the one-on-one -on -one learning platform so that once the virtual instruction would have begun, there are no glitches or hindrances to the process. And maybe the internet may not be as strong. Um, and that's, that may be uh, based on the home, you know, if a parent has a strong enough bandwidth, okay? Uh, from our school's perspective, what uh, we have observed, the way they would have set up the system if the electricity goes off, we still have enough power to where the internet will last a little longer. So teachers would then be able to make whatever accommodations needed to be made. With some 70,000 students across the country to be virtually engaged this new school year, Minister Lloyd also acknowledges consistent internet service as key to the education process. So not only Cable Bahamas, but BTC. Yes, every single week we have a meeting and give us a status report. So, for instance, BTC now has only 1G capability, okay? Between now and the end of next week, they're going to ramp that up to 3G, which they expect will be able to accommodate all 75,000 students in the Commonwealth of the Bahamas and make sure that they are able to get on without the Internet dropping, without them having any problems with the reliability and so on, 100%. They've given us that assurance. 
and we are holding them to that. Nevertheless, the Ministry of Education, as an overall precautionary measure, is preparing hard copies of learning packets for students. Carla Palmer, ZNS Network News. Training continues to be a big priority for teachers at the Eagle's Nest. And earlier this week, principal of the L.W. Young Junior High School, Deborah Thompson, told ZNS News that as teachers adjust to the virtual and hybrid learning process, training exercises to familiarize themselves with the latest technology will be beefed up to ensure a smooth process this new academic year. In order to prepare our, our students, we have to prepare our teachers. And so our teachers have been all week engaged in um, professional development, in small groups of prof pro um, professional development, in order to ensure that they are able to handle the new technology. Okay, because the technology is new to a lot of persons. And so if you're not tech savvy, then of course we need to make sure that you're ready. And that's what we're doing. We're making sure that our teachers are ready in order to handle the new learning management system and put the best out there. Additionally, Thompson says some 500 students matriculating into the hybrid model, which means students will come in face-to-face -face for three days and home for two days. She anticipates the new academic year to be a very productive one. My outlook for the new year is one of just hope because I know that as a people, we can do this. And also, I know that this is going to make us stronger, it's going to make us better, and it is going to equip our children even more to function on an international level. So this is going to open a whole new world to children who were never exposed to this world before, you see? And that means new challenges bring new opportunities. Students on the island of Eleuther are focused now on the new academic year. Acting District Superintendent Michael Calmer says all preparations have been completed to begin virtual learning in the 16 schools throughout the island. Complete our, that's the education and management information software program that's complete. The learning and management software program is complete. Our teachers have been engaged as part with other teachers in the Bahamas who've been working on the learning kit and our teachers would have completed those components that they were required to do uh, in in time and ahead of deadlines for submission and transmission. Over at the Beacon School, Grand Bahamas' only special needs school, teachers and administrators are welcoming their students with open arms after nearly seven months without face-to-face -face interactions. Here's Jay Philippe. After an extended break due to COVID-19, teachers are welcoming students at the Beacon School for day two of classes. Under cautious guidelines and safety practices to protect both students and teachers, Principal T.T. McKenzie Moore says after weeks of teachers' professional development sessions, she's impressed with what she has seen. This being the second day of school, I must say that everything is running smoothly. The students are following all our guidelines and protocols and also our staff members. And the parents are also um, doing what we requested of them. So we are very pleased with the second day reopening of school. For teachers transitioning from the traditional classroom in-person setting to virtual learning and now a combination of both learning tools has not been easy. However, special education professionals Shadia Cooper and Krishanta Butcher says they are excited to finally be back in the classroom. It's been a long seven months, but we are finally back. Um, we've been anticipating the start of the new school year, and when we got into the swing of things yesterday, it was a pretty smooth transition. The students came in, they adjusted really well to the new procedures, and each day we're just preparing them for what they have to do while on campus. When the students came in yesterday, they f seemed pretty knowledgeable about what has been going on. They are very compliant, they wear their masks, they ask a lot of questions, and they are eager to share their experiences of home and what they already know about COVID-19. We're following everything. If you can see outside, we have the social um, distancing um, footsteps. And I, I, which I am really confident that everything will be good here at the Beacon School. And I just want to ease the concerns of the parents who have not returned yet because of those um, safety concerns. And like I say, the students are excited to be back to school. I'm excited and I'm ready for a great positive year. For students like Stephen Russell and Kevin Jean, who returned to campus 
they were looking forward to opening week. It feels great to be back, that we finally get to come back on campus, even though we're in the middle of COVID. Um, it feels strange to see a little difference, but we still getting used to it. I'm glad to be back to school and to see my teacher and my friends. We do a little work online, virtual learning and PDF, just keep our brains running and everything. I'm glad to see my friends. And I'm glad to see all my teachers. They inspired me again to see school again. McKinsey Moss also adds that the adjustment for students has been straightforward. Our kids, um, just like normal children, they do understand. And once you explain to kids what's happening and once you model to them, they will definitely follow it. So our parents have been modeling. The kids have been seeing what needs to be done and they are following the protocols. Of course, we have some challenges with some of our kids who are not able to wear their masks. But as the school year go on and we keep modeling for them, um, they will definitely get it. I'm Jay Philippe, ZNS, Network News. Student athletes around the country who were looking forward to competing in various sports this semester will have to wait a little while longer. Sports officer in the Ministry of Education, Evan Wisdom, says that the situation is fluid and school sports could resume if the decision is reversed by health and government officials based on new information. Education has concluded that uh, we will be advised by the Ministry of Youth, Sports and Culture and uh, its director, Mr. Timothy Munnings. And as uh, evaluated so far, uh, we are operating under the protocols of the competent authority. With that in mind, the competent authority has not uh, uh, reissued any statement with regards to uh, the performance of uh, sporting activity. Um, and so at this particular time, for the first semester of the high school calendar, that calendar has been um, uh, um, canceled, okay? Uh, we are waiting for the review, uh, but as of now, for the first semester, sport in the high school system in terms of organized sport has been canceled. If you apply to fill a position as a trained teacher, an assistant teacher, teacher's aide, guidance counselor, craft instructor, school psychologist, or speech pathologist, this next one's for you. Such applications cannot be processed by the Ministry of Public Service and National Insurance unless all the necessary documents have been submitted. The original documents should be turned into the Human Resources section of the Ministry of Education no later than next Tuesday, October 13th. Failure to comply would suggest you're no longer interested in securing the position. Well, it's a busy scene here this morning in the area of Church and East Bay Street. Operation Sovereign Bahamas is hosting a protest which may cause some obstruction to traffic on the other side of the break. What do drivers need to know when approaching this area as well as a look at overnight traffic? Influenza, or the flu as it is commonly called, is a viral illness that usually occurs between the months October to March. The virus is transmitted from person to person through coughing, sneezing, or talking. Symptoms include fever, cough, headache, runny nose, generalized body aches, and fatigue. There is no specific treatment for the flu, and the symptoms usually dissipate after three to seven days. Because it is caused by a virus, antibiotics are not used to treat the flu. Persons are encouraged to rest and drink lots of fluids. Panadol is recommended for fever and body aches associated with the flu. However, aspirin should be avoided due to the risk of bleeding. To decrease the spread of flu, persons are encouraged to get their flu shot annually and practice good cough hygiene. Additional information can be provided by your community clinic or the Health Education Division at the Ministry of Health. This message is brought to you by the Ministry of Health in partnership with the Public Hospitals Authority.
During this pandemic, it is our duty to ensure that citizens, residents, and visitors are adhering to the COVID-19 safety protocol. Cleaning and sanitizing will help stop the spread of the COVID-19 virus. Pay special attention to areas that are frequently touched in high traffic by family, friends, and clients. Make sure you're using proper cleaning materials and sanitizers. Place all cleaning materials in the correct disposal or storage area. I'm Ambassador Brittany Johnson of the COVID-19 Enforcement Unit. Save a life that may be your own. This message brought to you by the Ministry of National Security in conjunction with the Broadcasting Corporation of the Bahamas. The ZNS community page now has its own home on Channel 230. Be sure to tune into this channel to see informative notices, funeral announcements, birthday greetings, and much, much more. So watch the ZNS community channel today on Cable 230. back. Well, Lloyd Allen and the Morning Edition traffic team is standing by with your Wednesday morning traffic commute. Good morning, Lloyd. The traffic report is sponsored by Bahamas First. First in insurance. Today, tomorrow. Well, good morning again, LaDon. Good morning, Bahamas. Of course, as we said earlier, it's a busy morning in the area of Church and East Bay Street as the protest is underway uh, in a few minutes uh, by Operation Sovereign Bahamas. Uh, they intend to be uh, traversing this area. And so, of course, we early advise drivers, if you approach this area, to approach with caution and with care. Other than that, no major obstructions identified. This morning, we're also speaking with Sergeant Crestonia Johnson from the Royal Bahamas Police Force Traffic Division, giving us an initial look at overnight traffic. A pleasant good morning to you and a pleasant good morning, Bahamas. Overnight, we've had 14 traffic accidents. Ten of those traffic accidents involve damage. Three of those traffic accidents involve injury and one hit and run accident. At this time, we still have four persons that remain hospitalized as a result of being involved in a traffic accident. Also this morning, Officer Johnson, obviously uh, some... Uh, uh, some buildup in this area as a result of this protest. Any advice for motorists uh, traversing this area? Yes, but if you had to traverse this area, you would notice that uh, it's not the norm. You'd have more increased traffic in this area, that is pedestrian and vehicular traffic. So we're asking if you had to conduct any business within this vicinity, that's the Church Street, Dadsville Street, and East Bay Street area, that you do so with added care and caution. Please be cognizant that everybody needs to use the street to get to where they need to go, to advising as much as possible for drivers not to impede the flow of traffic. Please be advised that strict measures are going to be in place by the Royal Bahamas Police Force to make sure the traffic is going to be regulated. All right, so an important update coming in there from the Royal Bahamas Police Force Traffic Division, as well as other members of the police force as uh, this uh, protest uh, is underway this morning. Reporting here from Church and East Bay Street for the morning edition, Lloyd Allen, ZNS Network News. Government keeping its commitment to support and fund small businesses across the country, Minister of Finance, Deputy Prime Minister, the Honorable Peter Turnquist, says that a $55 million investment will assist entrepreneurs operating in non-traditional sectors who often have difficulty accessing entrepreneurial support. This is most needed currently, for the task to recover from the ongoing crisis depends on creativity, determination, and grit. Of, small, of the small business community. The entrepreneurs who come out of the Access Accelerator will no doubt help to diversify the economy as more persons get involved and explore non-traditional business. The Access Accelerator is the government's tangible de demonstration of commitment to small business and to create opportunities to materialize wealth in non-traditional sectors of the economy. The Bahamas Telecommunications hosting its second annual virtual innovation conference for the month of October as a part of activities commemorating Small Business Month. The series of seminars held every Friday between 10 a.m. to 12 noon assist entrepreneurs in becoming resilient in the wake of COVID-19. This year, BTC is teaming up with a number of tech professionals within the Caribbean and the United States to provide insights to participants. Each international speaker the person to actually attend this conference will have the opportunity to win a half hour one-on-one -on -one session with each international speaker. That is something that you pay thousands of dollars for. 
people like Michelle Hoskins, she hosts classes to help people develop their products and help them distribute their products throughout the United States. So to spend a half hour one-on-one -on -one with her, to share your idea with her or whatever challenges you may be experiencing in your business, and for her to be able to help you through that, that's totally powerful. This week, um, we're going to hear from um, a gentleman who, Morgan, Robert Morgan, who owns Tess. Now, he's a gentleman that does the huge set of all of these, I mean, fantastic events like Ultra Miami and those in the United States that you see the really huge setup. You've heard about big businesses and corporations going the extra mile to help those in need during the COVID-19 crisis. But how about an elementary school girl? Well, Antoine Smith introduces us to a sixth grader who is attempting to help families suffering from the COVID-19 economic crisis one penny at a time. It started with an idea. When she came up with the idea, her father and I were like, you want to do what? And then it became a movement. Well, I just wanted to help my Bahamian people. Savi's lower school student, India Joseph, is the brilliant mind behind the charity drive Pennies for COVID, an initiative that seeks to take loose change, often discarded, and put it to some good use. I've seen on the news all of the people who have suffered from job losses, and I just wanted to help them by collecting pennies so I could feed some families. After consulting with her parents and then getting the officials at the Kiwanis Club on board, Zazavia's K-Club president took her idea island-wide, setting up penny collection boxes at any store who would participate, even involving Kelly's department store, whose officials could not pass upon the opportunity to be involved in something so great. There were not only pennies being put into those bins. There were actually dollar bills and quarters and 10 cents and stuff. Um, so that means... It was just not about the pennies. It was about the giving um, back um, to those less fortunate persons. India's penny drive is set to run up until the last day the copper coin is taken out of circulation in December. And as is her goal, the coins collected in these jars will be donated to charities like Hands for Hunger, hopefully helping more families in need. See, she's soft-spoken. She has a soft heart, and I always teach her that a humble child takes the grace of God. And the fact that she took it to this level, we are just so proud of her that she would think of something that wouldn't just help a small community, but would help, like, the entire island. And to help her cause, generous donors can find India's penny boxes at cash registers in participating stores all over the island. Anthony Smith, 7S Network News. Construction on the replacement dock in Rock Sound, Eleuthera, has begun with the work expected to be completed by May of next year. Minister of Works, the Honorable Desmond Bannister, says the current dock was in a serious state of disrepair. And the new upgrades are necessary as it will not only allow larger vessels to dock, but also make loading or unloading of goods or passengers a whole lot easier. Member of Parliament for South and Central Eleuthera, Hank Johnson, also noted that Eleuthera residents are happy that work on the new dock has begun, as the project is expected to boost the local economy through job opportunities for residents. Meantime, the fisherman dock removal and demolition is scheduled to begin on October 22nd, with a timeline for completion set for January 2021. Another phase of the Water and Sewerage Corporation's water extension project on Long Island progressing pretty well. Executive Chairman and Area Member of Parliament Adrian Gibson says a new tank platform has been constructed which will expand the capacity to deliver water to new service areas on the island. He noted that the pipe work is taking place at the site, paving the way for piped water coming into homes and businesses. So we continue to work towards finalization of the deep wells and the installation of a new storage tank and reverse osmosis plant in the McKinsey settlement. In recent time, there has been a challenge with the drilling process. However, I expect resumption of that exercise this, this week, and that is today. At present, three wells are being drilled at a depth of 400 feet per well. Stay close. The morning edition is back right after this quick break.
let's stay COVID free. Remember the three S's. Sanitize, social distance, and stay inside. Welcome back. As the Bahamas continues its fight against the COVID-19 pandemic, a pastor's forum has been created consistently of consisting rather of a group of 30 plus from the local clergy. The next installment will take place tomorrow at Mount Calvary Baptist Cathedral on Blue Hill Road. The theme vaccine for COVID-19 fact or fiction. This morning we are joined by one of the organizers, the Reverend Dr. Philip McPhee. Good morning, Reverend McPhee, and welcome to the morning edition. Good morning and thank you so much for having me. Now this is a very timely topic and I understand you will have two leading doctors spearheading the discussions. Talk to us a little bit about that. Well, several months ago we had the privilege of coming together as uh, pastors. Um, we recognized that uh, even though we are of different denominations, there was a gap in between conversations among leaders of the Christian faith in terms of pastors um, relating to pastors. We very much appreciate what the Christian Council is doing and has done and will do, but we, we, we came to the conclusion that pastors need to sit down and talk and to be educated and to be evaluated on what and where we are as Christian leaders in our country. So we organize a pastors forum, Bahamian pastors forum, consisting basically of over 30 pastors, inclusive of the, of the three, Dr. Hall, um, the Reverend Nick Hebburn, myself, and Bishop Russell. This forum on tomorrow uh, consists of two of the most distinguished doctors uh, in this country and maybe even in the world, uh, in the presence of, of uh, Dr. Charles Diggis, who is the president of the... Um, uh, the grouping of Doctors, Doctors Hospital and uh, Dr. Duane Sands, Honorable Duane Sands. Uh, they will talk about the uh, vaccine and uh, COVID uh, relationship that we are facing today because we have already heard that our country has invested a whole lot of money in, in the vaccine. But we do not know exactly what the vaccine is all about. We don't know um, which nation we are in contact with, with the vaccine. So there's a whole lot of questions. And we're hoping that these two distinguished doctors will give us some indication and information uh, by way of conversation to pastors and leaders of churches so that we can adequately uh, uh, give information to our congregations. Is this a closed uh, forum or are, are, I guess persons able to come in? When we first started, we really wanted to have just pastors. We've been bombarded with so many other people after hearing what's going on uh, that they want to sit in, even if they have to sit in the back. We have space for over 200 uh, at the cathedral on Blue Hill Road. Uh, they just want to hear what Dr. Sands and Dr. Diggis uh, would say to them because uh, we are in many instances in the dark. And we need to be enlightened. We need to enlighten our congregations. We need to enlighten our communities. And um, so it is, we are now opening it uh, to ministers and, and leaders of churches and those who are interested to come. Uh, they will be able to, to be a part of it, but they won't be able to, to actually um, ask too many questions, but we certainly want them to come just for information and conversation. And Reverend McPhee, what are some other future topics you're looking at for your forum? Well, we need to know what is this vaccine all about, one. Secondly, we've heard rumors of, of a, uh, uh, using some kind of instrument to put in your hand. <laughs> and all of that, we're not sure about that. Then we've been bombarded with information being sent to us from all over the world where they are discarding the fact of, a, of the vaccine period um, and the effect of the vaccine upon uh, uh, people in general. Uh, we've heard so many rumors about uh, in Africa where they uh, brought it to the, the African race and a whole lot of people were hurt, uh, even lost their lives. And so we need to be, have some clarity moving forward. And if that is the, the way our country is going, then we need to know what they are doing, 
when they're going to do it, how they're going to do it, and what it's going to cost us in the process. Thank you, Reverend McPhee, for joining us here on the Morning Edition, and best of luck on your pastor's forum. Thank Identifying you. unsung heroes is an important effort by any organization as it sends a clear message to the people who make up its team that every job counts. In our next feature from the Royal Bahamas Defense Force, we visit the commissary or the commissary on the base where we meet an officer who is all about giving Marines bargains for their money. Are you familiar with the quote, hard work pays off? Well, for woman Marine Brittany Darville, laboring as a junior in her mother's talk shop turned out to be just the right qualifications needed to prepare her for a future career on the force. As a child, we had a, what we call a little talk shop, where we sold snacks and chips and drinks to the neighbors. She soon advanced to a larger store where she showed a unique aptitude for precision and attention to detail. I was actually managing adults in terms of balancing the cash registers and making sure that the end of day sheet was completed. In 2010, she applied to join the RBDF and was accepted as a recruit in 2016. But by no surprise, she is now the lead agent at the Defense Force Exchange, a commissary on base which services more than 1,500 Marines and others. So now I'm able to manage my international ordering. Um, I was able to also utilize some of the merchants that I learned and used in the past, and now I'm able to bring that here for the Defense Force to benefit. Spending the last four years building relationships with international distributors, Darvel says that move made things a little easier to handle in recent months as travel was a challenge due to COVID-19 restrictions. I had to, to switch to more basically online ordering and emailing back and forth. And so the process is now even more tedious. So the Marines, they when they come and they see the products in the commissary, um, I sh I'm quite sure that many of them don't know the effort and work that I have to put in to, to get the job done. She adds, running the exchange is a full-time job, one she doesn't take lightly. I am mainly assigned to international ordering, but if my chief needs me to do something else, I will then have to do that in terms of cashing and serving the members of the Royal Bahamas Defense Force, stocking shelves, checking the inventory to make sure that I am not spending or purchasing more items than I actually need to purchase. And while the store provides a wide variety of items just like any other supermarket, she says toilet paper is likely the most in-demand product. It's like a precious commodity around here and um, the price is really good. Darville says while she enjoys her current post, her desire is to one day lead the entire RBDF operation. I wanted to actually be the first female Commodore of the Royal Bahamas Defense Force. And so I'm basically, I, I'm trying to get a little more experience on the rating side. Um, and then I'm, I'm still thinking about switching over to the officer corps. But as it stands now, I'm still, I, I like to be planned. So I'm, I'm, I'm just chattering my course as I go. So if you visit the exchange at the Coral Harbor base today, Darvel says know that you will be treated with excellence. Why? Because this is what I do. Lloyd Allen, ZNS, Network News. And it's time now for your Wednesday workout session with Natasha Brown. Come on down, Natasha Brown has got you with the ultimate fitness. Hi, this is Downtown with another awesome core workout. Remember, you do not have to lie down on the ground to always think that you have to work your core or your abdominals. These five exercises that I have are a variety in working the total core, which is the total body. So let's get right into it.
there you have it. Always go hard, bring the right attitude, willpower and courage, and you will definitely get the results you are looking for. Until next time, I am downtown Natasha Brown, taking you closer to becoming your ultimate you. This weather report is sponsored by Bank of the Bahamas, the bank of solutions. That's it for us this morning for the entire team. I'm the Don Davis. Make it a great day, everyone.